My name is Willem. I'm the data science platform lead for Gojek. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some of the lessons we learned scaling machine learning at Gojek on Google Cloud. So if we're all ready, I'm going to just dive in. So who or what is Gojek? So Gojek is an Indonesian technology startup. Um, so we have a wide variety of products and services, and some of them are on the screen right now. Um, the one that we're most famous for is our ride-hailing app a service, uh, Go Ride, and the, the image, the photo actually shows you what the service does. It's a woman being taken on one of these motorcycles to a destination. Um, the reason why it's not a car and it's a motorcycle is because of the unique challenges in Indonesia. So a lot of people don't know this, but in Indonesia, uh, or Indonesia is one of the largest countries in the world by population. They have over 260 million people. So it's the fourth largest country in the world by, by population. Um, and they have a lot of unique challenges with uh, public infrastructure and traffic congestion. And the way that Indonesians have solved this problem is by using motorcycles to get around. And they also have their own motorcycle taxis called OJEX. And when we originally started, we started as a call center for OJEX. So it is offline. There's no application. It's completely disconnected. You just call in, and we send an OJEC to take, to take you to your destination. Um, so originally, our founders uh, launched the service, and there was great growth and um, demand for it, because traffic is so bad in Indo Indonesia that uh, the service really solved the workday problems for Indonesians. And they continued to collect information about what products our uh, customers wanted in Indonesia. And in 2015, we launched our first mobile application uh, with just a modest bundle of products. So the key products there are Go Ride, the ride hailing on motorcycles, Go Food, so that's food delivery also on motorcycles, and then th things like Go Mart, so it's grocery shopping and other logistic services. And when we launched this initial application, uh, the, the uptake was incredible. So um, we hit hyper growth very quickly and the demand in Indonesia was insatiable because it solved so many of the daily problems that Indonesians had uh, getting around the city. Um, and so over the next couple of years, we launched a bunch of products, um, not just at random. We've always been a very data-driven company. We've always uh, looked at what the customers wanted and launched very targeted pro products to them. So currently, we are a unicorn, one of the few unicorns in Asia or, or in Southeast Asia. Um, and we've got 18 products that we've launched in the application and many more that are not in the application. Uh, in 2018, we are um, focusing on international expansion. But let's talk a bit about our home, Indonesia. So our app has been downloaded almost 80 million times. We operate in 60 cities throughout Indonesia. Um, and in many of our product verticals, we're actually the largest player. Uh, so if I can just talk to two or three of those. For ride hailing, we have more than a million drivers on our platform. Uh, on a typical day, you'll have hundreds of thousands of drivers online at the same time servicing our customers. Um, for uh, Go Food, our food delivery service, we have more than 200,000 merchants on our platform. And we call them merchants because uh, it's not just restaurants, it's also moms and pops that, have, uh, that are selling food from their garages. So this platform that we've built really allows for a kind of socioeconomic mobility um, and enables people to rise up from, from poverty. Um, so uh, the third product that I wanted to highlight is uh, GoPay. It's one of the leading uh, e-money platforms that we've launched uh, in Southeast Asia. So we have many different products, and uh, the, I just wanted to kind of highlight the scale at which we're operating. So uh, along with that is, is data. So this visualization represents some of the data points that we're dealing with. Uh, it's a visualization of Jakarta, uh, the capital city of Indonesia, where each pixel represents a person being dropped off or picked up um, on, a, on our GoRide platform. Um, so this, just, this is just a one type of data point that we have on a single product. But we have many types of products and data points. And data science plays a key role in our organization, and machine learning as well. When you have um, all these decisions being made in real time, machine learning is critical to um, uh, making those decisions. But the business and the organization looks to data science um, also to understand our customers. And especially with international expansion looming, we wanted to uh, understand what the unique uh, demands of our customers were in different markets. 
Um, so as a data science platform lead, it's my responsibility to make sure our data scientists are as efficient as possible, right? So that, they're, uh, that their time is being used correctly and that they have the right tools available to them, especially with international expansion. You don't want to just add more data scientists. You want to really um, add leverage to the existing ones that you have. So I launched an investigation into how our data scientists were spending their time to see if we can't um, improve their efficiency. And when we launched this investigation, uh, one of the data scientists on screen, Darius, came to us and said, hey, I've got a lot of uh, projects that I'm working on right now. Um, I'm actually getting a bit swamped. And maybe you can focus your investigation on me and see if you can't optimize the way I'm doing things. Darius is very representative of a typical data scientist in our organization. Uh, he's working on a lot of interesting things like fraud detection, driver allocation, personalization, and forecasting. Um, so he's got projects all across the board. And we thought that if we could solve Darius's problems, then we could solve uh, all the data scientist related, related inefficiencies. So we looked at where Darius was spending his time. And this is what we found. So this is a bar of the, where Darius is spending his time on a typical project. So as part of his life cycle of his project. And we, we honed in on the different tasks that he was doing. The gray areas represent tasks which we deem, deem to be not really data, sci uh, not really data science uh, per se. So these are tasks like provisioning infrastructure, installing software. Um, it's kind of a systems and engineering related work that Darius was doing. Uh, and then if you look at the colored blocks, those are the data science related tasks that he's an expert at, that he's good at doing. So we wanted him to focus more on that and less on the engineering. And if you have a call center uh, on one day and then a few years later you have a unicorn, a billion dollar company with thousands of employees, and you tell data scientists to deliver results, then you get a, something like this because data scientists will need to provision infra if there's no platform for them to build on. Right? They build these end-to-end -end systems. So what we told Darius was that we're going to um, we're going to try and solve your inefficiencies and problems, and we're going to look at all of your projects through three uh, different lenses. The first is the sourcing of data. The second is feature engineering. And the final one will be machine learning. And by looking at these three aspects, we'll, we're going to try and improve your, uh, the way you're spending your time um, so that you can focus more on, your, on data science and machine learning. So the first of the three is the sourcing of data. Um, and this is a very foundational block that we had to address before we could get on to machine learning and feature engineering. Um, so we asked Darius, can you give us an example of a project that you were working on where you had troubles with sourcing of data? And, and this is what he told us. He says he was working on an exploratory data analysis project. He had this hypothesis that if, you are, uh, if a driver is going to pick up a customer, the closer they are to the customer, the quicker it'll be to pick up that customer, except the bit of inf data that he had didn't indicate that. The opposite was actually true. So the closer the car is to the customer, for some drivers, um, the longer it takes them to pick up the driver. And this was very counterintuitive. So he, what he said was, OK, he's going to investigate why this is the case. Um, so what he did is he asked, uh, uh, so what he wanted to do is he wanted to look at the specific drivers in more detail. So he wanted more details, uh, data on the drivers. So he asked uh, other data scientists in his team for, for this data, and they didn't have it. He asked his manager. He asked uh, the VP of data science. He asked the CTO. Eventually, he was directed to a team in Bangalore that could potentially have this data. And it turns out they did have the data. Um, so what they told him was that he can't query their production database because it will lock the DB and it will ruin the driver experience. And so. The problem here is that this is not really Darius's job to hunt after data. So we knew that this is something that we needed to address before we could get to any of the ML or feature engineering. Um, so our realization was, don't go to the data. Let the data come to you. Um, so the key thing here is that Darius shouldn't have to go after the data. And we, need, we realized we needed to centralize data storage within our organization. And we did it uh, th through the following uh, means. We said. We're going to build a data foundation. And we're going to bring in all the data from all the product teams that are being uh, created on a very frequent basis. And we're going to do this with three components, BigQuery, Kafka, and Cloud Storage. So BigQuery will become our data warehouse. Um, this is a kind of no-brainer. I don't know if I have to sell anybody on BigQuery. It's big data store. It scales. It's easy to access SQL. 
um, Kafka. Uh, we needed some of the functionality in Kafka, and that's why we opted for Kafka in this case, but we do use PubSub as well. But Kafka is industry standard event bus, and cloud storage as our data lake. The problem with this is, though, that even if you standardize publishing of data to a centralized um, location, you, you have to force people, um, either through a stick or a carrot, to do that. Right? And we wanted to actually give them some benefits or incentives to publish. So what we said is, if you publish your data to the, to the foundation, we'll give you some benefits. And the benefits that we gave them were reporting, one, so that their managers were happy. So we automatically generate reports based on the data that you publish there. We give you automatic archival. Um, we give you automatic monitoring of, and alerting of your events on Kafka. Uh, and then finally, because you're using BigQuery and other, uh, or, and other Google services like Cloud Storage, you have centralized authentication and authorization built in. So with all these benefits that we gave all the product teams and other teams in the organization, they started publishing data. And once they started publishing data, uh, people like Darius and analysts and other employees could then find data and, uh, and this led to more insights. And so what Darius did is he went back and he looked at those drivers with the weird uh, pattern of uh, taking very long to reach customers. And this is what he found. So he, here are two images that illustrate uh, what Darius found when he looked at these drivers. So on the left, there's a driver that's permanently stationed on a building. And he's just always sitting there. And on the right, there's a driver that is moving through a bunch of buildings at 106 kilometers an hour. Now, then in miles per hour, I don't know what that is. That's like 60 or 70 miles per hour. But the point is that it's impossible. In Jakarta, nobody moves at that speed. That's like the speed of light in Jakarta. So what we realized is that um, these drivers were actually faking their location. They were using software that allowed them to pretend to be at a specific location so that they could get preferential treatment by our machine learning models when they were being assigned to trips. So in that case, the driver was pretending to be in the shopping mall, and then if somebody leaves the shopping mall, that he would be assigned to that trip. But in reality, he's actually far away, and then he would have to drive there. Right? So armed with this knowledge, Darius could then, have, uh, could then go and build a model that could identify these drivers and then react accordingly. So the key thing here is um, building a data foundation is fun foundational and fundamental part of um, solving ML problems. And you shouldn't be hiring data scientists, or not at, at least not many, until you've built this fundamental block. Um, so, so this is the first part that we did. Right, and feature engineering is the second part. So we asked Darius about um, how we could, uh, or what projects he has in feature engineering where he had frustrations with working with free features. So he told us about another project, and this one is a lot more important for De uh, Gojek. So this is the driver allocation problem. So Darius told us how this works. So basically, if, you have, if you're a customer and you're uh, making a request for a booking to go to a destination, you need to be assigned a driver. Uh, most customers think that, uh, okay, they just want the closest driver that's right next to them. You know, it's oftentimes, you can see on your little app, uh, there's a driver right outside your door. And you wonder why doesn't this uh, algorithm allocate this driver. But it's often a very complex process, right? Because sometimes drivers want to head home. Uh, sometimes drivers are on a trip. Sometimes they've just made a turn onto a highway and they're going to take a long time to turn around. Sometimes you want to optimize for the driver experience because they're also a part of our system, right? So the drivers might not have had an opportunity for a long time to take a, a trip with the customer. So um, they're also trying to earn a living. Um, so basically, Darius realized that a, the driver allocation problem is one that is uh, very dependent on features because the features will really drive the decision making of the model. And this model is actually extremely important for our organization. If you're doing 100 million bookings every month, this model is going to process a lot of money. And a small tweak to this model can have a massive impact on the bottom line. Right? And so Darius said, OK, let's first make a list of all the features we need. So he starts listing down the features. And these are some of the typical features that Darius um, off the top of his head came up with. So they're driver-related features, like uh, what is this location, speed, direction, ETA. Um, so focused on the driver features. And then there's also customer-related features, like the profile, what their clicks uh, are, their actions, um, their history. Then there are spatial features, like what's the demand in this area? What's the supply like, traffic-related features? And then finally, temporal features, like uh, what's the time of the day? What's the day of the week? Uh, is it a public holiday? Um, often in, in Indonesia, you have religious holidays that can completely change the way that traffic behaves and how supply and demand dynamics change. So 
um, he made this list of features and then he set about creating these features uh, so that he could train a model and then uh, yeah, deploy his model into production. But he ran into some problems. And these are some of the problems that he ran into. So the first problem he ran into was the volume of feature data. So we had the data foundation now, and what Darius was doing is he was spinning up virtual machines, and he was uh, scheduling jobs that would transform that information into features and then publish it somewhere. And then he would train a model on those features. This is a batch process. This is an offline process, but it's a scheduled one. The trick here is that for a data scientist, that's a lot of work. Um, these pipelines run for hours and days. The iteration cycle is very slow. And making a small tweak uh, means you have to rerun the whole pipeline. Making a mistake means you have to store it all over. So this is a frustration that is uh, costing us a lot of time, data science hours, something we wanted to solve. The second problem we had was with real-time features. So you can imagine if you have a Kafka or an event stream, you can't just run a query on Kafka, right? You need to actually build a system that streams that data into a data store uh, with transformations that builds features. And then you can access those features in real time. So. Uh, Every time we wanted to launch a project, we needed an engineer to come in and build a system that could stream these uh, and, uh, events and build features for real-time access. So this is something we wanted to solve across the board. The third problem we had was, was consistency. We had engineers now building features in real-time, and then we had uh, Darius building it in batch, but these were disconnected. The real-time features were in Java and Go and other languages like Scala and Darius was building his features in Python. So there's an inconsistency there, and this creates a problem because models are being trained on one set of features, and they're being served in production with different features, and there's a real scope for problems to come in. Um, also, there's a duplication of work. You actually just want to find a feature once, not twice. And then finally, discovery. So Darius actually went uh, to lunch with a data scientist, and he realized that this data scientist had uh, already developed a lot of the features that Darius had developed. And so Darius was redeveloping the same features due to a lack of knowledge and a lack of discovery in the organization. So we really wanted to, uh, we knew we needed to solve this problem holistically for the whole organization um, so that the discovery was there and the standardization was there. So our realization was that features should be free. Uh, you're going to have to pay a cost to build features the first time. and But after that, it should be available in all of your environments consistently, production, uh, for serving, and for training. Um, and it should be discoverable. And you should have information about your features. So we were going to uh, build this a platform for Darius to um, access features and create features. And the first part of that platform is Dataflow. So we had our data sources now with our data foundation. And we needed a way to solve the consistency problem. And how we did that is by introducing Dataflow. So what's great about Dataflow and why it's so suited for this purpose is because we want consistency, right? We don't want to redefine the same features over and over. And with Dataflow, batch and stream are um, supported as first-class citizens. There's really no distinction between the two. They're just different data sources. So with Dataflow, you can take in CSVs, you can take in events, you can take in uh, SQL, in SQL relational data and then transform it with a single transformation and produce it into any kind of data store. So by introducing Dataflow, we have a single place where Darius can build his or define his feature. Some of the other advantages of Dataflow is that um, it automatically scales. There's no servers to manage. Um, there's no lock-in because the code that you write on Dataflow, um, the API is called Beam, Apache Beam. It can be run on Flink. It can be run on Spark. Um, so there is a portability to the code you write, so you're not locked into Dataflow. Um, so some of the challenges with Dataflow is that because it's streaming and batch in all cases, the API is kind of tricky. You're also limited by the fact that Python and Golang support is not as featureful as Java. So in most cases, you'll be forced to write Java code. Um, so that's the trick with uh, Beam and Dataflow. Um, so in, often in the case of this is you'll need an engineer to help define the features with the data scientist. But the key, the key thing here is once it's defined, it's done. Um, it's always there. And it, you can store your features then in training, a training store as well as a real-time store. Um, so here's an example of a feature definition. So in this case, we're just going to look at how many trips the driver has completed in a day. And we take trip events. Um, this code is Python code. And then you apply. Uh, P transforms um, on the P collection. So the trip events is a collection of uh, events 
or elements, and then you apply subsequent transformations, like you filter out all the successful trips, so you're only left with that. Um, you add, you create a data structure with a count of one per uh, event, and then you just do a group by, and then you're left with the count for all of the drivers. So this is a very basic example of how you could define a feature. Although in our case, oftentimes we use um, Java to define this, but it has a lot more boilerplate. Right, so now we've solved the feature creation and standardization and consistency problem, but now we need to introduce storage as well. So for training, we introduced BigQuery. So BigQuery is just a no-brainer store for us. Um, we looked at a lot of um, our competing databases to store training data, but ultimately it came down to one thing. Our labeled data is generally in the data sources and as raw data, and our feature data uh, often needs to be joined onto our labeled data to create training sets. So we didn't want to have a, a completely distinct training store, or at least not for uh, as, uh, as least not if we didn't have a good reason. So we opted for, for BigQuery because of its um, high scalability and the fact that it's a completely cloud-based service. You don't have to manage any infrastructure. Easy to access, uh, SQL-based. Uh, for this use case, it's also very good because um, generally features are represented as columns uh, in the status store, and BigQuery is a columnar store, so it's very efficient at querying feature data. All right, so that's what we introduced for, tra for our training store. It's also very uh, closely integrated with other cloud services on Google Cloud. Um, but we'll get to that later. So for serving, we introduced two data stores. The first is Bigtable, and the second is Cloud Memory Store, or Google's hosted Redis. Um, Bigtable was really a game changer for us, not just for features, but for other applications as well. And the reason why it's so good is because um, it allows you to consistently access feature data at very low latency, so less than 10 milliseconds guaranteed. Um, it allows you to handle a very high load, so you can write and read to it up to 10,000 times per second combined per node. Right? And if you want to scale up, you just add more nodes. Right? So you can scale up linearly to any amount of nodes with Bigtable. Um, and then we also introduced Cloud Memory Store, or Redis, uh, for a similar use case. So sometimes when you have hundreds of thousands of drivers, uh, there's so many features, and some of those features change so frequently that the load is just incredible. Right? So you're going to have to spin up maybe 50 big table nodes to handle that load. So let's say you, uh, you're, you're, you need to update some features at a rate of uh, 200 or 300,000 times per second. It doesn't make sense to, to use big table in that use case for that use case. So we introduced Redis because Redis allows you to read and write at an extremely high rate. Um, often for these types of features, we don't care if the data store do goes down, so the durability of Redis is not really a concern for us. And then ultimately, we slapped on top of this whole system a feature-serving API. This API just intelligently finds where the features are located. So if a feature lookup request comes in, it breaks apart that request and finds the data and joins it back. Uh, and then also, very importantly, there's also caching in the feature-serving API. Without that caching, um, it's extremely difficult to handle the load. Um, but now if you look at this chart, you actually have a lot of information about the features. You, you've got Dataflow where you're creating your features. You know what features you've defined. You've got the access on the feature serving API, like how which features are being used the most. And then you've got the training store where you're uh, creating data, or BigQuery where you, you're creating training data sets and training models. And you know how good those models are performing at inference, right? So with all this data, if you log it, it's very useful to data scientists actually. And so what we did is we just dumped all of that metadata about features into a database, and then we just slapped on top of that Data Studio. So this is just a BI tool, essentially, that allows you to look at data. And we can see the relative efficacy or impact that specific features have uh, relative to each other for uh, predicting outcomes or optimizing for specific objectives. And if you expose this to data scientists, then um, it's a really powerful tool for some key insights. Um, and also, even if you didn't have any of the impact, if you just had a list of features, that's already useful to data scientists because then they can take this list and say, OK, I'm going to go to BigQuery and just select these specific features and train my model. Um, and then finally, this is what we've built. So we've got our data sources. We've got a standard way in which uh, Darius can define a feature to transform those data sources. He doesn't have to worry about the training store. He doesn't have to worry about memory store or Bigtable. Um, he doesn't have to worry about the serving API. All he needs to do is find features in the Explorer, uh, select them in BigQuery and train his model, and then remember which features are available uh, in the feature serving API. 
So, so we've solved his driver allocation problem uh, to a large degree because the feature engineering was the toughest part for him. All he needs to do now is define features as feature transforms. The final part that we're going to look at is machine learning. Right, so we've got both of the foundational blocks now of the data sources and feature engineering. So let, let's have a look at some of the projects that Darius was looking at or was working on for machine learning. So dynamic pricing is one of the key things that all ride hailing companies must make or m must uh, build. So the problem here is that if you don't have dynamic pricing, then you have inefficiencies in your market. So you have customers and drivers, and they need to be matched. Uh, the drivers need to service your customers. Uh, but if, if there is not enough drivers in an area, you need to incentivize drivers to move into that area and service those customers. And you do this by um, having variable pricing in specific reason, regions. So here is just an example of an heat map in Jakarta where the center of Jakarta has a higher, higher prices than in the outskirts, right? And this is just to incentivize drivers to move into that area to service those customers. So when we started with this model or this uh, project, uh, Darius said, okay, he's just going to take data that's on BigQuery, train an ML model, and he's going to deploy it. And that's what he did. He trained a model on some of the data, he had some ideas, and he deployed it on the outskirts of uh, one of the towns uh, as a small experiment. But there were some problems. Um, the first problem he had was it didn't scale. So his model was written in Python. It couldn't scale out of that experimental base. The second, model, the second problem was with this model that uh, it was not interpretable. It was a black box, and nobody else in the organization could explain what it was doing. And the third problem was even if we could look at the results of the model, we didn't know if it was good or bad because this is actually an extremely challenging problem to solve. It's very difficult to have a baseline or a control in this dynamic pricing uh, problem. Uh, if you have an experiment where you're raising prices in one area, you're affecting essentially the whole world. It's, there's no isolation or apples to apples comparison. Um, so y if you're raising prices, you're pulling in supply from external areas. And we had other issues as well. So let's say you've got uh, food as one of your products, so food delivery, and then you've also got essentially people delivery on GoRide. Um, they, they share a supply base. So if you raise the price on the Go Ride side, then you're taking riders or people that deliver food away from your other uh, product. And this is what we found, that it, we needed to have a, a very clear balance between our products in terms of dynamic pricing. So this was our realization. Do machine learning like the great engineer you are, not like the great machine learning expert you aren't. Um, and this was important for us. So uh, the reason for this is that we knew we were making a mistake by jumping into ML. So what we did first is we defined our objective. We built a very clear, uh, a very solid uh, engineering system that could handle the load and that could uh, handle a very basic mathematical model, not a machine learning model. And we deployed this uh, with clear objectives, with a clear measurement of success, with clear dashboards and monitoring and everything, without any machine learning. And then we had dynamic pricing. And now drivers could see in specific areas where the prices were higher or lower. And then they could service those areas. They were incentivized to go there. Ultimately, we would end up adding machine learning to the system. But at the start, the key thing was uh, knowing what your, what your success criteria is and building a rock solid engineering system first. Right? Um, but there's still some inefficiencies in the system. So what, of the, what, what a lot of the drivers were complaining to Darius about was that, okay, you can see that there are some areas that are high in demand, but there's, it's, it's high in demand for a reason. It's not high in demand for no reason. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that there's high traffic or there's a bottleneck or there's some reason why it's, it's hard to get there. So if they had some way to uh, know in advance that there's going to be high demand, that would help them. And this is where forecasting came in. Darius knew that he could actually forecast what the demand would be like in those areas. And so he set about, uh, or this is what he told us, building a model that would do forecasting. So he would take uh, all of the data, all of the supply data, demand data, traffic data, uh, user clickstream data, all the signals that he could get on a per region basis. So this is an extremely large amount of data, terabytes and terabytes of data that he was streaming in. It was so large that, um, or it, this model was so complex that we even took uh, both weather stations in Jakarta and streamed in weather data. Because if rain falls in Jakarta, then uh, traffic will immediately change very quickly. 
So what he wanted to do is he wanted to take all this data through a TF model and then predict on a per region basis or a per area basis what the demand would be. But he ran into some challenges as usual. Um, so one of the things that, he, one of the problems he ran into was that he couldn't actually train this model on his local machine, even as a, just a test on a subset of the data. And when he tried to, uh, to move the data onto a virtual machine and train it there, it also fell over. Uh, the virtual machine just couldn't load all of this data into memory. So what he did is he asked a bunch of engineers, uh, can, can you help me spin up a Spark cluster and train the model there? And so they did that, and it worked. They used Spark, and they, they trained the model, and they could actually deploy it. Um, but now there's a problem, because Darius is dependent on these engineers. Every time he wants to make a change, he needs to ask the engineers, uh, can you help me with this cluster? And another problem he had was that it was actually quite slow. It would take hours and sometimes more than a day to train this model. Um, so the lesson here was don't break abstraction. If you're a data scientist, um, try and operate w with the appropriate tooling at the abstraction layer that you're comfortable with and that you're an expert at. Uh, don't drop down into the engineering world unless you absolutely have to. Um, and as a data science platform lead, uh, it's my responsibility to give D Darius the tools that he needs to uh, operate at this abstraction layer. So what we introduced to Darius was Cloud ML Engine. So this is a, one of the reasons we also chose BigQuery as our uh, feature and uh, raw data warehouse. Um, so it's, it's got a very close integration with Cloud ML Engine. So with Cloud ML Engine, it allows you to train TensorFlow models. Um, it's a completely managed service. It scales automatically. Training is distributed. And there's some other advantages like um, you've got hyperparameter tuning, which means your models can be more accurate. You've got levers that you can pull if you want to iterate and train faster. You can go from CPUs, GPUs, TPUs. So this is what we introduced to Darius. And the way he used it was as follows. He's got his feature transformations already. So he's got his data flow creating features into BigQuery. Those are the time series signals that he is getting from the field, like the weather data that I spoke of. Uh, he trains a model on Cloud ML Engine, and he serves it on Cloud ML Engine. Then his signals are coming from um, Kafka as well. Um, so these are the raw events. And then he's got a separate stream that does inference. So this is just a Cloud Dataflow job that triggers serving on Cloud ML Engine. So if rain falls, it'll trigger Cloud ML Engine for a new inference, predict the demand, and then publish it back to Kafka. And so this worked. Um, one of the downsides to using Cloud ML Engine is that it only supports training for TensorFlow. So if you want to use XGBoost or Scikit-Learn or any of these, it doesn't work for training. You can serve those t uh, other types of models. But there are some downsides. But for us, the key thing was we wanted to have at least one tool that the data scientists could use without having to pull in engineers. Uh, so then we had forecasting. So these are just three of the different regions. Um, so here's a 30-minute forecast. The green line represents one of the forecasts, and the yellow line represents one of the, the, the actual values. And so we knew what the demand would be in the future. We could tell drivers this is an area that will be in high demand, or we could just change the pricing, and that will also influence the way the drivers react to the dynamics. But this wasn't Darius' toughest challenge. Darius had other challenges as well. Um, the, the toughest challenge Darius had was on the home screen of our application. So this is our f the home screen. And you can see at the top there are some products. Um, I go ride and go car on those. But at the bottom, if you, you can actually scroll down, there's a very long feed. And we have full control over what we display on that feed. And for us, it's extremely important to personalize our application. All of our customers use our application for different reasons. Some order food, some buy groceries, some use it as a ride hailing application. If you have 18 plus products, you need to customize it. And as an business, you have objectives like you want to introduce new products to certain customers. So this is a very important part of our application. Um, so Darius was tasked with building this model. Um, th what his model would get is uh, the user information, uh, so the user's uh, ID, it's the user's location, and the time at which the user has opened the application. And then what he has to respond with is a list of recommendations to personalize this home screen. But this is actually quite challenging because that data is only available to us when the user opens the application. See, the trick here is that we don't track users when they're not inside of our application. So we don't know where or when you're going to open the application until you do it. And the type of personalization we want um, 
or Darius described it as follows. Um, he said that, let's say you know that a person uh, will order a pizza for his children on a Friday night. He's been doing it for three weeks in a row. So you want to be able to recommend that uh, buying a pizza to him if he, does, if he arrives at home on that Friday night again. But if he arrives at the office or if he arrives at a friend's house, then you don't want to recommend that. Right? So um, that's the type of control we want in personalization. Um, so, so there are some ch the challenges, of course, that we don't know where, where or when the user will pop up. Um, so Darius said, okay, fine, he's going to try and build a model um, and to see if he can serve this. Right, so here are his targets on the right. So he needs to serve a response in 30 milliseconds. It's the home screen of the application. So you have to serve responses very quickly. Our SLO is at 10,000 requests per second. Um, so the, the throughput is very high. And with international expansion, we knew we needed to support even higher throughput soon. So this, was, this model that he built was an application. Um, it was embedded within an application. And it was before we had the feature platform. So in this case, he actually had user data that was loaded into the application statically as batch data. So he would get the user ID, the time, and the lat long when the user opens the application. And then what he would do is he would transform based on the user data as well as the incoming request new features. He would generate new features, put it into the TensorFlow model, do inference, and then it will produce a list of recommendations which he would return. And so what Darius did is he did a benchmark. He just had a look at what performance he's actually getting with this application. And this was his initial performance. His target is 30 milliseconds, but he was serving results at 140 milliseconds, which is almost five times too slow. So um, as a, any engineer would tell you, the first thing you do on Kubernetes is you scale it out. And that's what we did. Of course, that doesn't really solve your problem. Right? There's a certain amount of complexity in producing these results or, and, and doing inference. And scaling out will just reduce the load. It won't actually uh, minimize the latency that much. Uh, so then eventually what we did is we introduced the feature platform. And by doing that, we could externalize a lot of the features outside of this application so that only the model is hosted in the application. Um, and so that's what we did. But the latency was still too slow. It was taking too long to serve results. And we couldn't actually deploy this at scale in production. Uh, it would be too disruptive to the user experience. And we really hit a wall here. And this is a common problem because each pro project has a unique model with its own characteristics, uh, a completely unique system. Um, and so we mulled over this, and we came to a realization we should pre-compute everything. Um, of course, in this case, it's not that easy to just pre-compute everything because you don't know where users will be, and you don't know when they'll open the application, and you don't know which user it'll be. So the amount of combinations is immense. If you have mil tens of millions of users, um, you need to somehow reduce the, the amount of uh, predictions or recommendations that you want to pre-compute. And the way we did that is by doing two things. The first is we bucket locations into areas. So we say um, all the areas, all the locations within a football field size area counts as that area. And then we bucket time into windows of, let's say, 30 minutes or an hour. Then for each customer, so for each of our millions of customers, and for each of these tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of areas, and for each of these time buckets, we produce a customized, personalized recommendation. Um, but you're still talking about hundreds or th more billions of recommendations for a single model. So this is a really, really big data set, terabytes and terabytes of data. And of course, the solution that we presented was big table to store this data. So it's one of the few tools that we have found that can actually store and serve all of these recommendations. So the way that we changed Darius' system was as, followed, as follows. So users now have specific actions that they take. Like, let's say that you buy a pizza on a Friday night. That is something that describes your behavior. Uh, we log that as an event on Kafka. And then we have a Dataflow job that hosts a model, a TensorFlow model. And this model uh, streams in this event, and then it produces personalized recommendations for that user based on the uh, unique behavior of that user. And then it stores all of these recommendations, or it just updates the existing recommendations in Bigtable. Uh, so this process continually happens behind the scenes. And now our model service has changed. Now our model service is a lookup service. 
right? And so the lookup server is always doing is just looking at Bigtable at a specific landing zone where that information is found, and it just retrieves it and serves it. So if you think about this, this paradigm shift is very powerful as an engineer because your machine learning system is completely disconnected from the serving infrastructure. If you, if you delete or if you remove all of the ML pipelines and the event stream, you still have Bigtable that's independently testable that you know the characteristics of. It can handle terabytes of data. It can serve responses at 10 milliseconds. And um, you'll never have an issue as long as you've tested it at least once for your use case. So this is what we pre presented for Darius. And when we looked at the performance, it was good enough. 15 milliseconds, you're always going to hit that 15 milliseconds. There's enough buffer. Um, of course, this doesn't solve all of your problems as, as an engineer or a data scientist. Some models you can't pre-compute. Some you'll always have to have a model in a service. Um, but if you have the option, think about storing very large amounts of data um, as an option or an alternative to serving models in production because of the, uh, the production, productionizational abilities of that. So what are the impacts of these changes that we introduced to Darius? Originally, when we looked at Darius's workflow in a typical project, um, he was spending a lot of time on provisioning infrastructure, installing software, all of these tasks that were not really data science related. Right? We wanted him to focus more on what he's good at, which is uh, creating features, developing models, um, evaluating experiments and things. So we introduced what is essentially a platform um, but built on Google Cloud. And if you look at the data sources, we've got all the types of data sources that you want. Data Lake, you've got Event Stream, you've got BigQuery as your data warehouse. There's a single place where Darius can define his features in Cloud Dataflow. He doesn't have to define features anywhere else. Um, he can do inference in the stream on Dataflow by hosting Cloud ML models in Dataflow. Alternatively, he can also host it on Cloud ML Engine. Um, he's got a, a, a serving store in Bigtable and in uh, Cloud Memory Store and a training store in BigQuery. And he doesn't have to manage those. Most of this infrastructure is managed by us. And it's not really managed by us as engineers because uh, it's all uh, just cloud services in, in most of the cases. So all Darius actually has to worry about is doing modeling in Data Lab, finding features in the Feature Explorer, and then using BigQuery to create his training sets and using ML Engine to train those models. Of course, they will always be custom projects. Um, I think the key thing here is that we introduce uh, technologies that allows Darius to operate as his abstraction layer where he doesn't need to pull in engineers. He can do things on his own, and he can produce results on his own. He doesn't have to spin up infrastructure. So now Darius is using a lot less time uh, on a typical project. He's spending more time on developing models. And because of the time has been compressed, uh, it's faster for him to get to market, and he can take on more projects. So the impact on Gojek is um, our data scientists can now deliver projects faster. Um, we, ha we have more touch points within, within our application because we can deliver more models. Uh, our customer experience has improved a lot because now the models are more accurate because we have more features as well. Um, we have less data scientists per customer, and this is a great thing because uh, expanding to new markets, you don't necessarily want to just add new data scientists. Uh, it is better to leverage the existing ones you have. And obviously, having less infrastructure is a big win for us. It's less, less uh, time to spend managing infrastructure, and it costs less. And just to recap the lessons, um, let the data come to you. Centralize your data warehouse. Don't do anything else unless you've done that first especially if you have a very big geographically separated organization like we do. For features, you'll pay a cost once, um, but then after that, it should be free and available in all of your environments and discoverable and trackable. This is also a very important step. And then the third one was don't break abstraction. Uh, if you're a data scientist, operate with the tools um, at this abstraction layer that you are comfortable with, that you're a domain expert at. And then finally, if you have the option, pre-compute everything. Pre-compute results. Okay, that's it from me.